Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences. My name is Frank den Hollander. I'm a member of the mathematics section of this academy. Uh, that section is hosting this particular uh, meeting. So it's a particular pleasure to welcome you to this event in which we celebrate the 2023 Abel Prize. The Abel Prize is the uh, equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Mathematics, as you will hear uh, in more detail from uh, Jan van Neerwe. And we have been uh, uh, having e these evenings since 2019, where each year of the winner of that year we put in the sunlight and we um, celebrate the work through, uh, through uh, public uh, uh, lectures. And this particular meeting is for Luis Caffarelli, and it's been organized by uh, Jan van Neerwen. And I hope you have a nice evening. And I ask uh, Jan van Neerwen to start the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jan van Neerwen. I'm professor of analysis at the Technical University of Delft. And uh, I have the pleasure and honor to moderate uh, this evening uh, with you. Um, as uh, Frank de Holland already said, we are celebrating the Abel Prize 2023. We're just in time for this event because the Abel Prizes are always announced in the second half of March this year. It's uh, uh, about to be announced in a week, uh, the, the 20th. So, so, so we, we can still look back to the, uh, 23, uh, the 23 event where the prize was uh, awarded to the Argentinian mathematician uh, Luis Caffarelli. Um, the Abel Prize was established uh, on, on January 1st of 2002 for, quote, outstanding scientific work in the field of mathematics. And it's awarded by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. As I said, uh, the, the, the laureate is Luis Cavarelli. I quote from the citation of the Abel Prize Committee for his seminal contributions to the regularity theory for nonlinear partial differential equations, including, including free boundary problems and the monge ampere uh, equation. What that all is, is uh, for our speakers tonight to explain to you, uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, I thought it would be nice to give a, a small introduction on, 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 on the Abel Prize itself. Um, in some sense, uh, it is the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. As you know, there is no Nobel Prize for Mathematics. And uh, um, there are various stories around this, uh, why that is not the case. Um, uh, one version of the story goes that, uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, a mathematician uh, named uh, Mitag Leffler should have had an affair with Nobel's wife. Well, well this is easily debunked. Uh, and then there's the, the other version that uh, Mitag Leffler, who was a very influential Swedish mathematician uh, at the time, um, could, could use this uh, prize to manipulate things in such that he would be awarded uh, the first Nobel Prize in mathematics. And, and Nobel would not be in favor of that. Uh, th this is also easily debunked, uh, and there have been s uh, uh, several uh, interesting papers written about this. Uh, so the one I'm quoting by, by uh, Garding and uh, Herbender, but there are also more recent ones in the notices of the American Mathematics Society that you could have a look at uh, if, you, if you find this interesting. So, um, so, so then what's the actual reason that there's no, no Nobel Prize for mathematics? Um, well, it's interesting if you, uh, if you look at the will that, uh, that Nobel left, uh, it comes in two versions. The older version is very brief and states that a prize should be established for the most important and most pioneering work in the wide domain of knowledge and progress, but without uh, clear specification as to where the prize should go. Now, that would be a real unthankful task for any academy to, uh, to get this assignment and award a prize. Uh, but, but fortunately, uh, um, in, in the final version of the will, it singled out the five domains that we know that Nobel Prizes are awarded for, but it doesn't include mathematics indeed. And the most likely reason is that uh, this was simply not an area that Nobel was particularly interested in. And also, uh, one could speculate that, uh, that indeed Nobel is very explicit, that things should have a direct benefit for mankind. 
And of course, so the, <laughs> we can still uh, argue whether mathematic, mathematics has a benefit for mankind. I will argue it certainly does, um, but, uh, but maybe Nobel had a different opinion on the matter. In any case, so then, um, 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 then it was felt uh, uh, already at the time of the establishment of the prize in the mathematical community that something should be done about it. And uh, so first Lee took the initiative that uh, uh, one, one could use the centenary of, of Abel's birth as, a, as an excuse to uh, install a prize uh, for mathematics, which would then be the Abel Prize. And that was well received in principle by, by the king at that time, but then unfortunately Lee died just three years before this centenary. And then, um, then, then of course, politics took over. There was, a, um, uh, there was a union between Sweden and Norway, but that split up in 95, and then never anything happened. So, so that was where it stood for almost a century. And then it was felt in 2002 that that would be a nice occasion on the bicentenary of Abel to, to actually and finally uh, create this prize. And, and so it happened. And the first honorary prize was uh, awarded to Selberg, a, a famous Norwegian mathematician. And the first regular prize, if you could say, was awarded in 2003. So, so we're now in addition, I guess, 21, uh, if I count correctly, for the, for the actual prizes. And then um, uh, we're going slowly towards the uh, opening of the, the actual uh, content uh, part of the talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to announce three very distinguished speakers who, uh, who are experts in the areas uh, represented in the work by Luis Caffarelli. And they will um, talk about the, the several of these aspects uh, in, in the various talks. And um, to start with our first speaker, Juan Luis Vasquez, from the Autonomous University of Madrid. Um, uh, very happy to have him here. Uh, he is in, uh, a, 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 say a, an intimate of uh, Luis Caffarelli in the sense that he has eight joint papers uh, written with him. And um, the, the list of honors of Professor Vasquez is too long to, to recite here, so I'll just pick out a few things. So he, uh, he completed a PhD in the uh, University of Complutense in Madrid. Uh, he's author of several very well-known monographs, uh, of which perhaps the, the, the Porous Medium Equations book is maybe the, the, the most uh, uh, famous one, which appeared in Oxford 2006. He's former president of the Spanish Society for Applied Mathematics. And um, among the prize and recognitions that uh, were bestowed upon him, I, I just mentioned 2003, uh, the Spanish National Research Prize. In 2006, uh, Professor Vasquez was a, a, a main speaker at the International Congress of Mathematics in 2006 in Madrid. In 2001, uh, um, he was elected a fellow, sorry, 2012, he was elected a fellow of the American Mathematics Society. And in 2018, awarded a honorary professorship at Complutense University. Uh, Professor Vasquez also wrote a, uh, a, a very nice paper that was uh, first in Spanish and then translated uh, into English uh, for, the, for the Royal Spanish Mathematical Society about the work of Luis Caffarelli and in particular the relations that Caffarelli has with the Spanish mathematics community, which is very indeed very strong. And indeed, um, Professor Vasquez represents one of these uh, uh, collaborators of his. So please, Professor Vasquez, may I give you the floor? Thank you. I'm very happy to be here in the Netherlands. It is not the first time that I come to Netherlands to work for Wiskundig. I thank the Academy for Wetenschap and for this chance. And then I will continue in the language I think I uh, speak better. <laughs> and anyway, it's been a pleasure to be again in Netherlands. My visits in the old times, as Hans van Duin knows, were mostly to Leiden. Okay, uh, I was uh, very honored to be invited to speak about a person who is prominent in mathematics, and I had the luck to be his friend. Uh, 
uh, the outline will be first about uh, Lewis, then about regularity, which is uh, one of the topics if his uh, activity in mathematics that was uh, mentioned in the world. Then I will speak about what I did with him for uh, 40 years. And then uh, I will end uh, if, the li if the time allows with some notes on life with Lewis. Uh, uh, so, as was said here, 10 months ago in May 2023, Luis Caffarelli received from the hands of King Harald of Norway the Abel Prize. And the citation uh, was very clear. Uh, in order to motivate the outside scientific work in the field of mathematics that he had done, uh, they say that he had done seminal contributions to regularity theory for nonlinear partial differential equations, including free boundary problems and the mont pair equation. Now, this may mean literature for most of the public, but for the mathematicians means a concepts that according to Descartes, the famous French philosopher, have to be distinct and different, clear and different. So what are the concepts? I mean, first, uh, Lewis is a master of mathematical analysis of PDEs, which is a branch of mathematics very well recognized because of his influence in pure mathematics and his enormous interaction with applied mathematics and the sciences. And then, to, more, to be more precise, Lewis works in the equations of nonlinear type. Uh, linear equations are much easier than nonlinear. Doesn't mean that they are easy, but they have been studied before because they are another level of the pyramid of knowledge in this field. And uh, according to them, uh, he had also this geometric connection that made his reputation. Mathematics in the field of nonlinear analysis relies very much on uh, doing analytic computations with formulas, integrals, and derivatives. Lewis saw something in his mind in geometry with planes, hyperplanes, parabolas, and thing, surfaces that kiss each other. And then this is called, if they kiss, it's called viscosity solution. Looks like a bit erotic, but it is not. <laughs> and then the regularity of the solutions was he was very good at proving. He will explain why regularity is an important word. But this will be, let's keep it for a while. What is regularity? And then there were these obscure words, free boundaries and degenerate or singular equations. Okay. So let's go on. Uh, this is Lewis in Oslo. I was there, of course. Uh, they were happy. I mean, King Harald was not happy because he was sick. And then this is the official picture of Louis uh, Scaffarelli in Austin. And uh, let's go on. I mean, Louis, that's a bit of history. He was born in Buenos Aires in 1948 so you can calculate his life. Which means that mathematicians of very uh, high contributions nowadays uh, continue the professional life for decades. It's not this idea of the Fields Medal of working until you are 40 and then you are done. It is not true. They are not football players. They can continue working for years and years until a certain age. Uh, Argentina is a country that produced uh, excellent mathematicians during the past century. And I mentioned one of them, there are several, Alberto Calderón, which is very well known in harmonic analysis because born in Buenos Aires, he was a professor in Chicago and worked with the famous Antoni Zygmunt in harmonic analysis. And of course, Alberto made an influence on John Caffarelli to devote his life to mathematics. And Lewis finished his uh, degree and went to the United States in 73. And then several years went on, more or less quiet years, 
And in 1977, he attracted the attention of the experts in nonlinear partial differential equations because he contributed a very novel idea about a problem that they could not solve, the big experts at the time, which is the regularity of obstacle problems in several dimensions, several means more than two. And then the paper was published in Acta Mathematica, which is a sign of prestige in mathematics. And he was at the time in the University of Minnesota, where I visited him in 1982. This was my lucky year. I began working with him in that year, and we uh, started a collaboration that was changing my life. Later, he was a professor at the University of Chicago. He was at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, now in the press because of the Oppenheimer Prize. And then he moved to Current Institute in New York, and finally he went to Texas, the University of Texas in Austin, and he has been there since 1997. He wanted, um, well, it's my opinion. A quiet place with the university that supported his big effort in mathematics. Texas is a rich state they could allow to promote a big uh, center of mathematics in, in Austin. And uh, he has stayed there. And he made the uh, UT Austin a worldwide PD center uh, for all of these years. And many of us visited Austin because of that. I mean, Austin has good country music and several other things, but we went to, vi to visit Lewis. And his excellence was celebrated with a number of nominations. I will not speak about prizes, because the big prizes that make like a, tra a transition towards the Abel Prize. Uh, these are younger versions of Lewis. There is a certain tradition now among the academia and uh, cultural institutions of presenting uh, important people when they were are yeah, already very old. And this is not very just, because we have going on through life since they were babies. To, and this, it's important to have the picture of the time where he produced the important new results. So these are two of them. And well, let's go to math impressions. Before I go to the real math, Let's give you some impressions of people in authority and who will tell what go is behind what he did. But before, let's see what he did. For more than 40 years, Luis Caffarelli has been the driving force of a very large number of researchers all over the world. A truly global endeavor with different groups in different continents devoted to better understanding the intricacies of the behavior of solutions of relevant partial differential equations. So it's to know the difficult parts of what are the solutions really when they solve relevant partial differential equations. What does mean relevant? Relevant, and this is well known in Netherlands because there is a strong school in applied mathematics, means the mathematics that have an influence on physics, biology, economics, probability, and geometry. So there is this interaction that makes mathematics work between different fields. And PDEs plays a central role in many of the calculations. Uh, however, fundamental questions relating to the existence, uniqueness, regularity, and stability of the solutions, which is what people in analysis of PDEs should produce, are not solved. Some of them are very relevant questions, and people don't know them. Stephanie will speak after me about the millennium problem of the Navier-Stokes equation. Nobody knows really what is the fine mathematics behind this equation. And this is not very nice, but it is like it is. Some of the problems in mathematics are really very difficult and resist attempts of solving them for years. This is where innovators are very important. And then people will say in applied mathematics, we have now powerful computational tools, but the more complicated and realistic models usually are not reachable only with computations if you want uh, reliability. 
it, you have incredible amounts of numbers, but it doesn't mean that you can predict the future. And this is something you can understand when you look at the situation in the computations for weather forecast or for climate studies. It's not a question of running the model and looking at what happens in your computer. This is where the theory comes to tell you, if you understand it, uh, how things work, the inner working of the things. And if you know how things work, you will get certainty. You know where the solution will be. You know that they will be reliable to use it. And there is a possibility of making innovations with different systems and combinations of equations that you never thought before that you could do. So combining brilliant geometrical insight, Luis Caffarelli uh, worked on these analytical tools for PDEs, and he had an enormous impact on the field of nonlinear PDEs. He opens ways of looking at problems that set new directions. And some people will, oh, sorry. It is, uh, oh yeah, this is a picture of uh, recent Louis. Oh, uh, this is one picture with me in Madrid in 2017. Pablo was probably around there. And, uh, uh, one of the persons who told, uh, wrote uh, beautiful words about uh, Luis Caffarelli was Helge Holden on the occasion of the uh, Abel Prize because he was in the Abel Committee. And he said that he combined brilliant geometrical knowledge with ingenious analytical tools. And then he added, uh, Caffarelli's theorems have radically changed our understanding of several classes of nonlinear partial differential equations which have wide applications. His results are technically virtuoso and cover many different areas. Well, this is an opinion. Another opinion is Francesco Maggi, which is an Italian mathematician who is now professor in Texas. And he says, 40 years after his path-breaking papers, we have digested them, and we know how some of these things can be done very more efficiently. But when they appeared, in the early 80s, these ideas were alien mathematics. So he discovered ideas, he saw things that we didn't know. And, then, and now I, we understand them because the analytical tools are very powerful. We can understand what he had in mind then. And uh, there is another um, um, opinion of jean philippe Solovey, president of the European Mathematical Society. And since the time is short, I will leave it on the screen uh, so people online could read it. Uh, and let me jump to the next uh, part, which is what I am supposed to do, which is talking about one bit of mathematics. We have we will touch three bits of mathematics here. One of them that, that belong to my uh, uh, responsibility is talking about regularity of nonlinear elliptic and parabolic equations with free boundaries. Well, the idea is the following. Let's do some mathematics. If you begin to, let's think about a model problem. Model problems are problems that are chosen very carefully, look like, uh, I mean, uh, naive but they have the difficulties that other more difficult problems will face again. Now, think about a membrane that obeys the rules of elasticity. And this membrane is attached to a certain frame, which is curvilinear, and since it is elastic, the membrane will not be flat, will be curved. The idea is what is the surface Expand by this membrane because of the curved, uh, the curved way it is attached to the boundary. Or maybe the membrane is attached to a flat boundary, but there is a force pushing it. Okay, so the idea is how a mathematician does it. The idea is you begin with energy physics and define the certain energy functional that says that in the amount of um, uh, elastic energy on the membrane is a certain function of the gradient of the height. U is the height of the membrane on the plane, Z equals U of XY. And since the membrane is, has a certain curvature, it is 
expanded and there is an energy due to elasticity and the amount of this energy will be a certain function of gradient u which is the gradient of the height and then the theory says according to the elasticity theory the physical equilibrium configuration of the membrane will be the one that minimizes the energy so it's a question of minimization of an integral and this is what is called calculus of variations since the time of Leibniz and company you go on and you say oh uh, uh, the energy that you begin with has to be relatively simple, otherwise you complicate too much your life in the first day. Take the gradient uh, square. This energy is called the ideal energy for a membrane, which is called the Dirichlet integral. It was studied by Dirichlet in 1830-something. And then they discovered that if there is an energy and you make this uh, calculation of the increments of the energy when you are around the minimum, you discover that the minimum configuration satisfies a partial differential equation. That is called Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, the differential equation corresponding to the square energy is the Laplacian. And the Laplacian happens to be the king of all differential operators in applied mathematics. So there is a good news in applied mathematics. There is an operator that is better than the rest and you have to study Laplacians all the time and your life will be better if you understand them. So the Laplacian is related very directly to minimi minimization of the uh, elastic energy. Okay, and in, in this case, in the Dirichlet case, rigorous mathematics works, and there was an analysis done by Poincaré and Hilbert at the beginning of the 20th century that says that there is a solution, and the solution has the derivatives necessary to satisfy the equation. Oh, because there is a problem for the mathematician, not for the lay people. The mathematician has to prove that the minimum function has two derivatives so that the Laplacian is equal to zero. Otherwise, there is no Laplacian, and the calculus is only what you call heuristic calculus. We are not doing heuristic calculus. Poincaré, Hilbert, and Dirichlet didn't do any heuristic calculus. They proved it. So let's go to general solutions. If you have an least elastic energy that is not the square of the gradient, your life is more complicated. But this is where mathematicians earn their living. So now you have to minimize this energy and then put some, let's put some force, pushing, pushing the membrane with some, uh, for instance, in gravity, some, some ball put on it. You minimize, and then the Euler-Lagrange equation for this thing can be written. I will not write it here today, but you know, the experts know, that there is a partial differential equation equals F. And the problem is, uh, okay, so now, can we prove that the minimum of this possible, all the set of possible energies is satisfied, sorry, is satisfied by a function that has one, two, three derivatives, and this is different, and this is difficult. Okay, so the idea is, uh, when, what happens when F is, for instance, differentiable and complex? Then you can prove that the solutions are regular in the sense of mathematics. And this is what Hilbert's problem. So let me go to what Louis Caffarelli did with this problem. Louis Caffarelli did the following thing. The problem has a variation with the possible, when the possible positions of you over the, over the, over the space have a, rest, a condition that they have to lie on top of a certain mountain. And then we have to minimize the possible situations of the membrane on top of a certain mountain. 
and then you say uh, what you do in two dimensions, maybe you can do it in three dimensions, and maybe your situation will be difficult from the point of view of mathematics. So this is the problem that Lewis was trying to solve. This is in red the membrane, this is in black the mountain where the membrane is sitting. This pink thing is the contact thing between the membrane and the, and the, and the, and the mountain. So there is nothing to talk there. But the problem is that uh, in this free or flying part of the membrane, you have to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation with the problem. You don't know what is the line separating pink from free. So there are two. Your pointing at your own screen. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I was thinking that they will see online this, but anyway. This line, the separation between uh, the contact and the flying part, is not known. If you don't know it, you cannot solve the, sol the, the, the solution on the flying part, which is the free membrane. So you have to solve two problems. The situation of the membrane has a contact part that you don't know. And this contact part has a border that is the only thing you want to know. If you know the border, it's okay. But you don't know it. And then there is a free part of the membrane that solves the equation. How do you solve the two problems together? This is the problem that Luis Caffarelli solved using the old ideas of the Georgi in a very ingenious way. And the solution of this problem, the free boundary problem of the obstacle, says that the free boundary is indeed the union of C1 curves except for possible exceptional points. There are possible, probably some points that are singular, and they are not good for free boundaries. They will have connections between two, po two, two curves. This is possible. But the points that are singular are, in major theory, not very many. And you have to see how they attack this problem. But. Once you go to the free boundary in the regular points, it are very beautiful curves, and the problem in the membrane can be solved with the unique solution. And the solution will be regular. Regular means that all the derivatives that come in the calculations are true, and they are in the classical sense. Will it be true in all the applied mathematics in the classical sense? This is a difficult problem. But the paper of Caffarelli that he wrote an expository version of this thing in a paper in 1980, which is uh, these compacts of, um, compact, oh, sorry, compactness of free boundary, methods for free boundary problems, where he introduced a beautiful idea called blow up method. The blow-up method was really impressive, and everybody's using blow-up method. But this is something that has to be studied in a doctoral course. And then, in order to finish this exposition, let me tell you that Louis wrote uh, different versions of the obstacle problem, and then he wrote a book with, with Sandro Salsa in 2005. And even today, He's working on these things. In 2019, he did with his uh, Greek collaborators, Athanasopoulos and Milakis, a problem for obstacles uh, in the parabolic sense, when they move in time. And I think that this explains the idea behind one of the main contributions of Luis Caffarelli to mathematics, which is problems in the calculus of variations will have sometimes free boundaries. We can calculate the free boundaries. We can calculate the solutions. They are regular most of times, and the singular sets have to be studied. And in many cases, they are, can be eliminated. But in other cases, they will be singular sets, and these sets are difficult to investigate for mathematicians. They are not a millennium problem, but they are a very difficult problem. Uh, I will finish here by telling you that in order to contribute to my life with Luis Caffarelli, I wrote a version of my work on, 
uh, uh, the problem of um, uh, free boundary is called uh, the porous medium problem. And these are the type of, type of free boundaries you have in porous medium. I will not tell you because it is a long time, but let me explain to you that uh, I wrote a book where, thanks to Lewis, I was able to explain the free boundaries of the porous medium equation, which are, again, uh, surfaces that separate uh, a certain gas from a certain empty space, and the gas is like a cloud gas propagating into empty space. And then the front that separates the gas from the empty space is very important in applied mathematics. Think about uh, uh, a gas reservoir in, in petroleum uh, engineering. And uh, after that, I only will tell you that uh, uh, Louis uh, has been always a uh, person with a uh, very easy way of communicating with uh, people in the personal life, and it was difficult to follow him on the mathematical life. But he had always an interest for international collaboration, and the amount of uh, countries that were his close collaborators in some sense of having more than three papers are like 20-something. Uh, it means that in this, count, in this world that has too many problems, the branches of science that we know will be in our, our still and will be in the future international. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vasquez, for this interesting lecture. Let's see if the audience has questions. As Jan Abram said, uh, I wrote a version, uh, a text version of the life of Cavarelli that will appear now in the European Mathematical Society magazine. I'm delighted with examples of uh, uh, how when it is useful, so applications. You mentioned an example of an application. Uh, is there another application that comes to mind? Oh, the, any of these models of partial differential equations with three boundaries who has behind because there was a all, always an interesting applications in the Louis Cafferelli school. For instance, the membrane problem separates one region that does not have contact with an obstacle with regions that have this contact. There are many uh, applications in elasticity where you have these problems in different situations of uh, pressing against the solid, right? In the case of porous medium, uh, there is a whole set of applications. For instance, uh, propagation of populations, where they do not propagate like a heat equation to infinity. They propagate with a certain distance, and you want to know the front of propagation of this population. But you also want to know the front of propagation of uh, oil, oil reservoir. And you want to know a front of propagation of an explosion of a bomb in the air. So there are many problems in phase transitions where the transition from empty to occupied, it, one of the main uh, objects of interest in for the applied mathematician is not the, the problem of the saying more or less what is the solution. You want to know where is the solution. Where is the solution is a geometry problem that is not possible to solve without knowing what is the partial differential equation. And then they had another problem that is very typical and other people will speak, which is the Stefan problem of uh, ice melting into water. And this is applied in the industry to uh, transition in the furnaces, steel furnaces between solid and liquid, right? Uh, you have known uh, Luis Caffarelli over a long period of time. 
collaborated on eight papers with him. And I was wondering, is there any special moment that you're particularly attached to that you would like to share with us about you know, your interactions with, uh, with Luis? Yeah. Uh, he had this idea that uh, we had to work a lot. And then all of a sudden at 5 p.m. he said, listen, Juan Luis, I had to go home because I had to cook dinner. Do you want to come? So after five, there were no PDs, and he was cooking dinner and talking to me. And this is really incredible, right? He was a very good cook, Italian, Argentinian school, and this transition, for me it was, like, but I knew where the free boundary was, 5 p.m. <laughs> At 5 p.m. he said, uh, in the lucky days, he said, will you come with me? In the non-lucky days, he said, I go home. And another of the anecdotes that I like a lot is when I wrote the book on Porous Medium, I was offered to write the book in 2002. And I told him, listen, Luis, that is the offer. You should le be leader the, of the book. I do most of the writing, but you are director. And he said, let me think. And then next day he says, no, do it yourself. I have to be busy with proving theorems. And come, come to discuss with me anytime you have any problem. And this was my idea with the book. I had like a, some person checking that I was doing right <laughs> from, from far away. Okay. So these are two instances of his way. And then the third thing that I shared with you also is that he had this geometrical intuition. We were doing integrals and derivatives and Euler-Lagrange equation. And who is, who is looking at the parabola touching another thing? Because if the parabola touches from above and below, things have to be C1, according to him. So things are C1 because Lewis look, looked at certain parabolas. And this is something that can be studied. In the end, you have to prove it. There is nothing that will be done if you don't do, in the end, analysis in a rigorous way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then it's time to move to uh, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Stephanie Zonne from the Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, Stephanie is a, a specialist in infinite dimensional systems and various aspects of nonlinear PDE and stochastic PDE. And uh, um, let, let me mention a few prizes and recognitions uh, of Stephanie. Um, in particular, in, in terms of teaching. So Stephanie won the, the Radboud University Teaching uh, Award for Young Talent and the Faculty of Science Education Award for the Best Junior Teacher. Um, her talk will be, uh, as already uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Juan Luis, about uh, um, the, uh, another aspect of, uh, of Louis Caffarelli's work, um, namely the, the equations of, uh, of fluid dynamics. Uh, the title of her talk is The, the Motion of Viscous Fluids, Na Navier-Stokes Equations and Regularity of Solutions. Stephanie, please, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan, for the introduction, and many thanks for the invitation uh, to give a talk here at this symposium. It's an honor to be here to celebrate yeah, the uh, Louis Caffarelli's work, his Abel Prize, and yeah, this fascinating research field of nonlinear partial differential equations. So I will talk about one, just one very particular equation, one particular PDE, the Navier-Stokes equations that describes the motion of viscous incompressible fluids. And one of his seminal contributions that concerns the regularity of solutions. So what I will do now, Luis Caprelli's work addresses the analysis of nonlinear partial differential equations. I will sh sh comment a little bit more on the problem of regularity that Juan Luis has already <coughs> mentioned, which was in fact a central theme in Luis Caprelli's work. And then I introduce these Navier-Stokes equations, a PDE, a highly complicated PDE, that models is a model for the uh, motion of viscous incompressible fluids. 
and I comment on the mathematical challenges. And then in the last part of the talk, I will focus on a seminar result that Louis uh, Caffarelli obtained in collaboration with Kohn and Nirenberg, and that addresses the partial regularity of the Navier solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation. And in fact, that's a highly complicated mathematical problem that is still unsolved. In fact, one of the millennium problems. So, yeah. Um, Luis Cavarelli, in fact, obtained a PhD at the Universidad de Buenos Aires in 72 on a different topic, on special polynomials. And then he moved um, to the United States, first to the University of Minnesota, um, and switched to partial differential equations. Um, in 1980, he was offered a position at the Courant Institute in New York and started to study yeah, equations from fluid dynamics, the Navier-Stokes equation. And in fact, already in 82, he obtained this remarkable result in collaboration with uh, Louis Nierenberg and Robert Kuhn. Later on, he had positions in Chicago, in Princeton, and Austin, what uh, Juan Luis also already mentioned, and worked on a large variety of different partial differential equations. So yeah, he was always, he liked this connection of mathematics with applications, with other fields of science. So his work was inspired by understanding certain phenomena. Say you have a model, and you, or uh, you observe a certain phenomena, a certain behavior in an experiment. Um, can you also prove that, what you expect, the behavior that you see? Or does your model really predict the reality? So these are questions questions that can be answered by mathematical analysis or by an analytical um, study of these equations. So let's look at a very, very simple example. Say we throw an object, I have this pointer in my hand, I throw it, can we predict two of you is gonna catch it? Or can we write down a model, an equation that describes or predicts the curve of that object? Say we throw, no, we throw a ball, we know the initial position of the ball and the initial velocity. Can we predict the trajectory that a, a ball makes in space? Now, x is the, uh, the horizontal direction, y is the vertical direction. x, y are functions of time that describe this curve of the ball. The derivative is the velocity of the object. The second order derivative with respect to time is the acceleration. So then, by Newton's second law, say we keep it as simple as possible, we assume the only acting force is gravity that works, no? uh, points um, uh, vertically downwards. Well, then the equations that we can write down based on say, Newton's second law, no, the acceleration is proportional to the sum of the acting forces. Um, so mass times acceleration, mass times the second order derivative of the functions x and y is equal to the acting, sum of the acting forces. And if we, if we assume that only gravity acts, then, well, we have only a force component, the second and the um, vertical direction. Well, that's a very, very simple e example of a differential equation, an equation that involves derivatives of an unknown function. And that is, oop, this. The point is here, this is a trivial example. In fact, the right-hand side does not even depend on the unknown function that we look for. We can simply integrate, in fact, twice, use the fact that we know the initial position, the initial velocity, and can write down the solution. Okay. But this was very simplistic, say, can we make the model a little bit better? No models have different levels of complexities, have different levels of details or precision. So say we include air resistance. No, the air resistance is proportional to the velocity of the object. <coughs> so we have an additional term on the right-hand side, and now we see, okay, the unknown functions are x and y, and now the right-hand side also depends on the derivative of these unknown functions. So that is a little bit more complicated. We cannot simply integrate to get the solution, but nevertheless, it's a simple, ordinary differential equation that we can solve explicitly. Now we can find first uh, expressions or solution formula for the first order derivatives. 
by a, yeah, a solution, yeah, the solution method for this type of ordinary differential equations. We can write down the, the solutions and then we can integrate once more and find, in fact, an expression for x and y that describes the trajectory of the ball. And now we saw as we include air resistance, so we, yeah, the ball will fly a little bit less far than if you ignite it. So these are very, very simple examples um, that yeah, show of differential equations. We know that a solution exists, the solution is unique, and we can even, in fact, compute the solutions explicitly. So um, here, the unknown functions only depend on a single variable, that's so-called ordinary differential equations, and they have a particularly simple structure. Oh, they have a particularly simple structure. Um, these e two equations are in fact decoupled. The first equation does not depend on the solution of the second equation, <coughs> and the same applies for the second equation. And they are linear, and linear equations yeah, are typically much easier to solve than nonlinear problems. So the situation becomes much more complex if you look at partial differential equations, if you look at systems that are coupled, you know, where the right-hand side of the equation depends on the solution of the other equation, and for nonlinear equations. Okay, so if we look at partial differential equations, the unknown functions are now functions that depend on several variables, more than one variable. So you can think of position x in the three-dimensional space, and time t. And a partial differential equation is then an equation that involves the unknown function and all of, yeah, possibly all of its uh, uh, partial derivatives, the derivatives in the different directions. And now different from ordinary equation, differential equations, typically there's no general solution theory that applies to partial differential equations. So each Nearly each class of partial differential equations requires its own methods, its own theories. Um, and partial differential equations cannot be solved explicitly, except for very, very few and simple um, classes. And yeah, the complexity of the problem of the PDE increases with an increasing numbers of variables that are involved. So the more variables the function depends on, the more different partial derivatives can be involved. And uh, the complexity also increases with uh, an increasing number of PDEs that are involved in the model. And with the level of non-linearity of the, of the equation. Okay, so say we have a nonlinear equation, we have a model that predicts a certain phenomena, then what, will, what do we want to prove or what do we want the model to, to guarantee? That's, uh, first of all, existence of a solution. No? There should exist a function that solves that equation and that predicts what, what the outcome of, say, this experiment. Uh, uh, we want uniqueness, we want a unique outcome. And then we want that further key properties of the system or of the phenomenon are satisfied. We can think of, for instance, energy conservation, or say, if we have a model where the solutions describe densities or concentrations, these quantities should remain non-negative. Or, well, the functions involved should remain finite, for instance, pressure or velocity. Um, yeah. So now, uh, Louis Caparelli mainly worked on these nonlinear partial differential equations. And in fact, most real world phenomena are nonlinear. And these nonlinear partial differential equations arise in the most diverse applications in many different fields. So, par nonlinear partial differential equations can describe water waves, quantum mechanical systems, the propagation of wildfires spread of diseases or chemical reactions. And these nonlinearities, I already mentioned, they typically make the problem very, very difficult. So they are the beauty, but also the struggle when we uh, analyze partial differential equations. So for linear equations, they are typically easier. There is a certain toolbox, there are certain properties 
that hold, and that we can apply in order to try to find solutions or to solve them. Um, but uh, non-linear, these methods do not work for non-linear partial differential equations. So typically, for many non-linear partial differential equations, require tailored methods and often novel and innovative approaches. Um, but on the other hand, also these nonlinearities lead to very yeah, interesting and uh, uh, complex behavior. For instance, they can lead to shock waves, chaotic behavior, or the formation of spatial patterns. So despite of centuries of intense research in the analysis of nonlinear partial differential equations, there are still fundamental questions that are remained unanswered for some key equations. And one of these key equations are the Navier-Stokes equation that I want to focus on for the rest of my talk. And one of these fundamental questions that remains unanswered concerns the regularity of solutions. So the Navier's, oh, I first want to explain um, what regularity R is. So in fact, there exist different concepts of solutions. So let's look at the king of the PDEs, the Laplace equation that Juan Luis already mentioned. Um, so um, we call, now we have the, oh, we have the no, Laplace equation. That means we say take this, uh, we have a function in two dimensions, so we have a function that depends on two variables. And we differentiate it twice with respect to x and twice with respect to y and, and sum it up. And then a solution, uh, or U is called a classical solution of the Laplace equation. Well, it, if, it, if you can differentiate it twice, if the derivatives are continuous, and if this PDE, this equation holds in every point of the domain. Okay, but um, this notion of classical solution is often too restrictive. It's often very, very difficult to directly prove the existence of a classical solution. Um, so the idea is to weaken the concept. We look at a weaker notion of solutions. So we increase, increase the pool of candidates, of functions that are possible candidates of, uh, of a solution of the equation. And then, yeah, we can prove first the existence of these so-called weak solutions and then try to show that they are in fact more regular. So how can we you know, derive this notion of a weak solution? Well, we look at the Laplace equation, multiply it by a smooth function phi that is zero for large values of x and y, and then we integrate in x and y. Now we can integrate by parts, we use the fact that this function phi vanishes for large values of x and y, and then we can, oh, but then we can shift the derivative to the function phi. And then we get an integral equation. Basically, we reformulated the problem as an integral equation. And now we call u a weak solution if u satisfies this integral equation for any such function phi. No, okay, and now we need significantly less requirements to explain this integral equation. U does not need to be continuously differentiable. Well, we have to make sure that these integrals exist. And this reformulation only involves first order derivatives of this unknown function u. So we have a much larger pool of functions that can solve this weak formulation. Okay, now what is the typical strategy or very common strategy if you look at uh, or study nonlinear partial differential equations? This existence theory for weak solution is broadly applicable and it relies on controlling certain quantities, certain <coughs> estimates of norms of these solutions and abstract arguments from functional analysis. And then, yeah, th the typical strategy is in, in fact to first prove this existence for weak solutions and then study regularity. That means once we know that such a weak solution exists, is this solution more regular? Is it a classical solution? Um, or if that's not the case, can, for instance, singularities develop? So throughout many decades, Louis Caparelli made pioneering contributions in regularity theory, and also quote the Abel Committee, 
Um, his contributions are technically virtuous, combining brilliant geometric insights with ingenious analytical tools and methods. And one of the yeah, seminal, many seminal contributions concerns the regularity of the Navier-Stokes equations. So the Navier-Stokes equations, they go back to Claude-Louis Navier and George Gabriel Stokes. So Claude-Louis Navier, he was a French mechanical engineer and physicist, and already in 1822, he wrote down these equations in an heuristic way. Then, in the subsequent decades, um, the full theory of fluid dynamics was developed, and it was then George Gabriel Stokes, among others, who wrote down <laughs> the equations in the mathematical formulation. And in fact, the uh, Navier-Stokes equations are the simplest model for the motion of an viscous incompressible fluid. So what does incompressibility mean, mean? So you can think of water or oil. Say you have a basket of water, you put a lid on it and try to push it down. Then you will notice you cannot reduce the volume. Well, that's incompressibility. And then, well, this model is based on the, not the fact that the flow is accelerated by areas of high pressure. So if you have an area of high pressure, you would have an acceleration flow from this here area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure. And also by the drag of surrounding particles. No, if say one particle of the, if surrounding particles are moving at a high speed, they would drag along um, another particle. And that's what, um, what viscosity means. So, okay, as the simple example I discussed in the beginning, the Navier-Stokes equation are in fact based on Newton's second law, on a balance of forces. So, and these are equations that are written down for the velocity field. So V denotes the velocity of the fluid, oh, V denotes the velocity field of the fluid, and P denotes the pressure. And these are these unknown functions that, that we aim to find. Now, on the left-hand side of the equation is the acceleration that takes a very complicated form because we write on an equation for the velocity field. On the right-hand side, we have the sum of the acting forces, and we assumed, well, we have a force that uh, is due to the pressure, and we have this viscosity term. Now, to explain this viscosity term, you see the, uh, maybe the easiest is the example is if you think of honey, you know, if you put a spoon of honey in a jar, uh, jar of, now, if you put a spoon in a jar of honey and take it out, then well, this honey will stick on the spoon and very, very slowly fall down. If you do the same experiment with water, the situation looks very different. No? So water has a low viscosity, honey has a very high viscosity. Um, then we have this second equation. Oh, I'm always pressing the wrong one. The second equation that is a mathematical yeah, formulation for the uh, condition of, of incompressibility of the fluid. Okay, so we have a partial differential, a system of partial differential equation for the unknowns, uh, the vector field and the pressure. Both functions depend on the position, a three-dimensional point in space, um, and, and time t. Well, if we write down the equations component-wise, we in fact see that we have a system of four equations, uh, no, three equations for the three components of the velocity field, and one equation that describes the incompressibility of the medium. So this equation can predict and describe very complex flow patterns, and the difficulties are, it's a system of four coupled partial differential equations. There's a nonlinear term here on the left-hand side, that is somehow the acceleration due to the flow, uh, flow, um, fluid due to its own velocity. And also another nonlinearity comes in through the pressure term on the right-hand side. And also, well, this incompressibility of a fluid also have this effect that if you apply a force, so if you change the pressure in one point, you immediately feel it very far away. So, um, yeah, these are, in fact, very, very difficult uh, 
partial differential equation. These uh, Navier-Stokes equations are widely and successfully used by physicists and engineers to solve many practical problems. Now, for instance, to design the wings of airplanes or the blades of windmills by simulating the airflow around, around them. They are also used for weather forecast or to model blood flow in arteries. Um, and yeah, due to the fact that these equations are highly nonlinear, the numerical simulations are also computationally very expensive. So this development of efficient numerical tools is also an active field of research. Um, but yeah, we go back to the fundamental mathematical and analytical questions concerning existence re and regularity. I'll say it is a model that is more than 200 years old and it is widely used, but still fundamental questions remain unanswered. So assume we have, you no, know, we have the Navier-Stokes equation and we have a smooth initial data, the, say the initial velocity of the flow field is given and somehow we would have expect if this initial velocity is smooth, then this flow should also evolve in time smoothly. So the solutions should remain smooth for all time later times. So we could call physically relevant solutions, solutions that have a finite energy, where the velocity and the pressure remain finite, and these, ex uh, uh, these solutions are smooth and exist for all times. But yeah, to prove that is an extremely difficult problem. In fact, it is one of these millennium problems that, one of seven millennium problems that the K Mathematical Institute um, announced in 2000 and for, well, yeah, for the solution you can win a million dollars. Um, so the question is roughly the following, no, do solutions exist for all times and are they smooth? or can this flow get out of control? No more precisely, well, you can prove either of these two statements. Either you prove that for any smooth initial data, um, the, uh, there exists a solution that remains smooth for all times. The second alternative is, well, there exists smooth initial data, and you can also allow for an external uh, force F, such that the there exists a solution that becomes such that the pressure becomes infinite. Yeah? And this problem is still up to, no, up to now on unsolved. So in fact, so far only partial results have been obtained. And there's an extensive literature, many, many publications on this topic discussing properties of the solutions and uh, um, of the Navier-Stokes equations and related equations. Um, I, and I name here only a couple of facts, known facts. So do solutions exist and are they smooth for all times? Um, for small initial velocities, the answer is yes. For more general initial data, it is also true, but only for a short time. So short time, this flow the velocity field will remain smooth, but we do not know what happens afterwards. And if that's not the case, then there exists a solution such that the velocity field blows up, that becomes infinitely large. And also in the problem in two spatial dimension, the answer is also yes. So this problem has already been solved in the 60s, but un unfortunately it doesn't allow uh, to, to advance in the three-dimensional um, case. Yeah, so concerning the existence and regularity of weak solutions, um, I want to mention that Lire already proved the existence of weak solutions in 34. But the uniqueness of these weak solutions is still unknown. And also the regularity, you know, the, the smoothness of these solutions is not known. So in fact, only partial regularity has been shown. And first by Schaeffer in 77, using uh, ideas from geometric measure theory. And then this result has been significantly improved by Caffarelli, Kohn, and Nierenberg 
in AD2. And this is this celebrated paper on partial regularity of solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations by Cavarelli, Kohn, and Nuremberg that um, appeared in the journal Communications on Pure and Applied Mathematics in AD2. And it states the following in very simple terms. Now we denote the singular set, or we call the singular sets, all these points in space-time <coughs> such that the velocity field becomes unbounded in any neighborhood of that point. And then the main theorem says, for any suitable weak solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation, the one-dimensional Hausdorff measure of the singular set is zero. So this one-dimensional Hausdorff measure is a generalization of classical measures such as the volume or the surface area. And say the one-dimensional Hausdorff measure of a piece of a curve is one. But if this one-dimensional Hausdorff measure of a set is zero, that means this set must be very, very small. So it cannot even contain a piece of a curve. And so if singularities appear at some time, then they will not persist. And they occur in just very, very yeah, few points, you can think. Um, yeah. So the proof is highly technical. In fact, it's a paper of 60 pages. And uh, this proof is uses suitably scaled parabolic spacetime cylinders and lo local regularity estimates of the solutions. And the idea is then to cover the singular set by su the suitably scaled parabolic spacetime cylinders while still controlling their size. And then this allows to derive an estimate on the household dimension of this set. So this paper uh, for the authors received for that paper the Nero Stiele Prize in 2014 for seminal contributions to research by the American Mathematical Society. Um, and what is also remarkable is not only one, but even two of the authors obtained the Abel Prize, so Luis Caffarelli last year, and then uh, Louis Nierenberg in 2015. Yeah, and this paper was a milestone, a landmark in the study of the regularity of solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation. And in fact, the methods used were inspiration of understanding of uh, the behavior of solutions um, later on. And uh, yeah, remarkable also, this result is still the best result on regularity or partial regularity for solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. So yeah, to conclude, um, mathematical models for fluids are highly relevant, used in many, many different fields and applications, but very difficult to analyze. That does not only apply to the Navier-Stokes equation, but also to related models. <laughs> there are still many mathematical unsolved problems, and most likely to make an advancement in the theory of regularity um, of such class of equations, deep new ideas are required. And despite intense research, and despite the promise of a million dollars, um, this uh, result by Caffarelli, Kohn, and Nierenberg on partial regularity is still the re most recent major contribution in the study of regularity of solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. Yeah. So. Afterwards, Luis Cavarelli branched out and investigated many other complicated partial differential equations while, um, and uh, yeah, tackled many, many other mathematical challenges while the regularity theory always remained a central topic. So I listed here only a few and about one of them, uh, some of them, uh, Pablo Raúl um, will tell us about next. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for this beautiful lecture. Thank you. Let's see if the audience has questions. Okay. As someone from the more applied sciences, I'm very much used to having vortices in flows, etc. 
I haven't you heard you use that word very much. Could I you translate that. your regularity results in terms of what vortices might do, how they could emerge, or whether, whether they would only be transient? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, oof. Uh, that I see. These, um, yeah, these singularities could lead to turbulence. Could be. Now, okay, but it, it should not. No, um, can I translate that to turb? I didn't say I'm not sure. I said no, no, vortices. vortices. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, no, I don't know. Well, and there is another group of people who have been studying the problem. Uh, which is around uh, uh, Pfefferman and Constantine. Mm -hmm. And they have been working for the last uh, 40 years of that, and they have more or less understood things that could not happen. Mm -hmm. If a vortex is formed and tries to move, this is going, goes against the regularity that we have uh, proved in the sense that uh, it has to be a very small uh, mm, setting measure, so there is no vortex that can move along the line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they don't know really how possible singularities could be. The impression at this moment seems to be that they could, could be singularities, but they are not none of the predicted anti until now models. Mm -hmm. They should be very strange models. And this is work by the, all the people in around the Princeton School. Mm -hmm. There's time. One last quick question with a quick answer. Uh -huh. Maybe you could comment on having a little bit of compressibility, because you know in real life there's maybe a little bit of compressibility. So is this an artifact of insisting on having zero compressibility? Again, a bit of an applied question, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you, this, uh, yeah. I, concerning regularity, I, I don't know. In fact, I don't know what that, uh, how that affects it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think if okay. you have time, uh, I think yeah. it's Stephanie uh, once more. <laughs> we move on to our last speaker tonight, uh, Pablo Raul Stinga uh, from, uh, um, from Iowa State University in the United States. Pablo is a, a country fellow man of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Arbor Laureate of tonight uh, from Argentina but he did his PhD in Spain at Complutense. And I learned actually in the, in the run through that we did before this meeting that actually Pablo attended as, as a student, I suppose, or PhD student lectures by uh, Professor Juan Luis Vasquez uh, at Complutense, uh, which, which is a coincidence I was not aware of when, uh, when the speakers were invited. Um, uh, Pablo works on uh, harmonic analysis and PDE, nonlinear PDE, and in particular um, uh, his work on fractional Laplacians is known, and uh, he's wri writing a book on this uh, as we speak. Uh, among prize and recognitions, I would like to mention diversity awards, which is also a very important topic nowadays, and I was very much involved in that, and he won a, a prize with a very complicated name, the Amherst Chamber of Commerce Fuel Story County 4 Under 40 Awards. <laughs> but that's, that's for his uh, ex exemplary service and commitment uh, to the profession in the community. And he also won the 2009 the Iowa State University College in Liberal Arts Sciences uh, Inclusive Excellence Award. I don't know if all places in the United States have that long names, but these really stand out. Uh, so uh, uh, w another thing that, uh, that that's really nice for tonight is to know that, that uh, also uh, Pablo has, has two joint papers with Luis uh, Caffarelli. And um, Pablo, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. 
Well, thank you very much, Jan, for the nice introduction. By the way, it wasn't autonomous, uh, Complutense, it was Autonoma. <laughs> so to make a correction, I, I studied there. Um, well, for me, it's a great honor to be here in this prestigious academy, and I would like to thank the organizers, and of course, Jan, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor, especially because, well, Luis Caffarelli, uh, I, I appreciate him very much, uh, uh, and you will see in, in my talk, and uh, of course, being a, uh, a fellow Argentinian, it makes me much prouder, uh, together with Leo Messi. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'll talk about uh, Abel Caffarelli and his more recent work on uh, non-local equations, okay? So, let's see. Okay, here's a picture of Abel from the uh, University of Oslo. Uh, so Abel is at the beginning of Caffarelli's career, right? Uh, uh, in his dissertation. So, and how does come up uh, through Abel summability methods? So um, if you do a Fourier series, you think about Fourier series expansions, you try to solve the heat equation, the Laplace equation with separation of variables or Fourier's method that the engineers do all the time, then uh, you have a function and you do a series expansions with sines and cosines at complex exponentials. But then uh, directly study this series may be very complicated and even there are uh, some, some uh, very uh, important theorems about you know, uh, weird situations with this Fourier series. So you introduce this R to the K for R between zero and one and hope, well, that that will behave better and it does. And then when R goes to one, this uh, R to the K disappears and you should recover F. Okay, and introducing this R to the K in the series is the Abel summability method, okay? Uh, which Abel introduced uh, when he was looking at some numerical series. And this is a problem in harmonic analysis. Uh, so the key object to understand uh, this, uh, how this happens, right, in which sense this happens, you need to study the maximal function where you take the worst case scenario, right, the maximal value of R at each point that, uh, that uh, so if you can control this object, then you can uh, prove this convergence. All right. But you know, Fourier series expansions are, are very good for certain geometries, but you do, you know, uh, differential equations in different geometries, in cylinders, in, uh, uh, I don't know, in toruses, and so on. So you end up with different orthogonal expansions. So these this PKs become a different thing in a different geometry with a different measure and so on. You know, so, and this is a question of how to do these sort of things for non-Fourier series but for orthogonal expansions, a question that uh, started in the mid-60s with a paper by Mackenhau and, and Stein in the uh, uh, University of Chicago. So here is a picture of Luis. Caffarelli, and as I said, Caffarelli and Abel are related from the very beginning of, of Louis' career because his dissertation is on Abel's summability of uh, multiple Jacobi series. So instead of having sines and cosines and complex exponentials, you put the Jacobi polynomials, which are very classical orthogonal polynomials, and uh, let's see what they, they do. So the purpose of this paper is to extend to the case of Jacobi series results on four and three. Those are papers by Calderon, Calixto Calderon on uh, Laguerre expansions, and those of five. And the five is the Mackenhaus and, and Stein paper, okay? And um, they study the convergence of the series. And uh, here they say that they need to understand the corresponding maximal operator. And for that, the results of two play an important role in getting the estimate you need. And what is two is this paper in Studia Mathematica where they study the maximal function, so the, the, the object you need to, the worst case scenario that you need to control in order to be able to have that, that convergence, okay? And this is the uh, Caffarelli's dissertation of uh, 1972 at Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina under Calixto Calderón uh, which is the brother of Alberto Calderón. Alberto Calderón, together with Anthony Zygmunt, they created the Chicago School of Harmonic Analysis. Uh, but this is not Alberto, this is Calixto, his brother. Okay? So those are the two papers from his dissertation in 72, but they were published in 74, both of them. Okay, so you have the Jacobi polynomial series expansions. Now this is the Jacobi polynomials. You introduce this R to the K. 
and consider the, the worst case scenario. And uh, then Caffarelli and Calderon prove that this operator is bounded on uh, the corresponding weighted LP with some different measure than just Lebesgue measure, and it's a weak type. And as a consequence, uh, they get the convergence of the series to F when the R goes to one for almost every point and in the weighted LP norm, okay? So this is Luis Caffarelli dissertation, which is in harmonic analysis for orthogonal expansions, okay? in Abel's summability methods. And in his uh, acceptance speech for the award, he even mentions that, that uh, he thanks his uh, advisor, Calisto Calderon, for introducing him to Abel's summability methods. Hmm? Okay, so I would like to mention this uh, university in, in Argentina, so a little bit of geography. This is South America. Uh, here is Argentina. Uh, Argentina is divided in provinces. And then in the middle of Argentina, there is this province called San Luis, okay? And San Luis, there is this city of San Luis that has this university, National University of San Luis. And in 2008, uh, the picture is a little blurry, but in 2008, Caffarelli receives the Doctor Honoris Causa from this university. And here he's signing the paper with the, with the dean. And uh, here he's receiving the diploma with the dean in 2008, and, I'm, and this is special to me because I studied at this university. <laughs> and I graduated from there, and I received my diploma from the same dean. <laughs> Before Luis. <laughs> but it wasn't the honoris causa, it was much just my undergrad. Uh, so that's very special. Uh, okay, so uh, another thing about the, my university is that's when I, heard, I first heard about Luis Caffarelli. So I had a, a, a class on partial differential equations, and my professor was talking about Luis Caffarelli and free boundaries and obstacle problems and so on and so forth, okay? And uh, of course, in that class, we studied the heat equation, okay? So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna quickly mention what is the heat equation in terms of, uh, of random walk, okay? Uh, and this is the uh, interpretation of the heat equation that Luis Caffarelli always used. So what is the random walk? So you have a unit of time tau, positive, and uh, you are randomly moving left or right with probability one half, right? So you take a step of size h, either to the left or to the right with probability one half. So then you write an equation for that. What is the probability that I'm gonna be at point x at time t? Well, I either come from the left with probability one half or from the right, no? So from the previous time, t minus tau, I come either from the left or from the right with probability one half. That's the chance I'm gonna be at, at, at xt. Okay, so then uh, you rewrite this in, in a convenient way. So you subtract this, this term here in both sides. You have the two and the two. You divide by tau, multiply by h square, right? And you are a numerical analyst. You already know what these objects are. This is the derivative in time of the function, and this is the second derivative in space of the function. And that's what happens when you take the limit in tau, in your, your time step, and your uh, step step, uh, step size goes to zero. If this uh, front thing converges to something meaningful, then you end up with a heat equation, okay? So this is the idea of diffusion that things start to regularize, right? So. Uh, uh, you can think about piles, right? And these piles, if, if uh, and Luis Caffarelli will mention this, you know, if you have an initial data for the heat equation that has a hu huge peak, because the heat equation, what is behind is, well, you start moving randomly left and right, then there is some sort of a averaging that is happening, so then solutions immediately uh, uh, are smooth. Mm? And that's the idea also of diffusion, right, of Fourier. No, the uh, caloric energy moves from places of higher concentration to places of lower concentration. So, okay. So that's what I, uh, I learned uh, also in my differential equations class. And if the, now the random walker is more complicated in several dimensions and you are moving, you know, in a heterogeneous medium, like there are rocks and things like that, then there are certain directions you can move, certain you cannot, you, we, you, you end up with a parabolic equation with uh, more derivatives of you in several dimensions, okay? And Luis Caffarelli, uh, as I learned in my PDE class, uh, made breakthrough contributions to the regularity theory of, let me just mention this, nonlinear elliptic equations of 
equations that are involve second derivatives of u and position x, no more general than this. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about these full nonlinear elliptic equations. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the non-local non differential equations. So again, at the time when I was a student, I used to go to many, many conferences, as many as I could to learn as much as possible. <laughs> and one of those conferences was in 2005 in Buenos Aires. And it was a meeting in honor of Professor Carlos Segovia from Universidad de Buenos Aires. He's a renowned mathematician uh, 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 from Argentina. Of course, Luis Caffarelli knew him because Luis Caffarelli studied at Buenos Aires. and. Uh, he had a, a lot of, of appreciation and respect for, for uh, Segovia. And uh, well, Segovia had uh, a lot of uh, uh, relations with, uh, with Spain, the mathematics in Spain. Um, so in that conference, Caffarelli gave a mini course about the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian. Right? This was essentially the dissertation of his student, Luis Silvestre, uh, in 2005. And well, <laughs> Of course, I was a recent, un uh, recent undergraduate. I didn't understand much, right? <laughs> but uh, I know for a fact that uh, many of the, s of, the, of the specialists in the audience uh, didn't understand much either. Mm -hmm. But this was the beginning of, of, hi of his work on non-local equations in 2005. And he was already talking about that in that conference. OK, so what were the kind of pictures he showed? I, I remember this, this picture the potato chip geometry, okay? So, so here you have a wire and you have a membrane, right? And, uh, and then you have a line that is an obstacle. So when you push the, the wire down, right, this, the, the, the line here, the, the membrane will touch, will touch the obstacle, which is this line. That's this potato chip configuration. And he had another global geometry where you say you have a, you have a big blanket, right? And, and you have an obstacle in one dimension and you push it down. Okay, so then this is like a non-local equation. Let's see how. Let me explain a little bit this, this obstacle problem that is it's called the thin obstacle problem that is related to a problem in mechanics called the Signorini problem. But uh, so say we have the upper half space. So this is Rn and this is the y positive axis. And you take an obstacle, right? A little mountain here, phi of x on Rn. And now you take your blanket yeah, your elast elastic blanket, and uh, lower it down. Uh, you lower it down, uh, and then what's going to happen? Well, the elastic membrane, the the the, ma the 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 blanket is going to stick. It's going to touch in some places the obstacle. It has to be above the obstacle all the time because it's an obstacle, and then it will go down. Okay, so u of x y is the graph of this of this blanket. So what equations are we going to have from this, from this configuration? First of all, the u on, on Rn has to stay above the obstacle, OK? Only on that line. Second is a harmonic function. If you think about it, like if you have a membrane in equilibrium, uh, the membrane has averaged itself in the sense that a point is being pushed in all the directions, essentially, with the same intensity, if you want. So you have a mean value property. There is an averaging property. So it has to be you know, a harmonic function. This is this equation. But now, the membrane, I, I'm pushing down the membrane, right? So, so in the direction when you are entered into the half space, right, the membrane is going down. So the derivative with respect to y has to go down. It has to be negative. Right? But on here, where there is no obstacle, nothing is bothering me, then nothing, nothing should happen. No? There is no preferred. You are not trying to go down, trying to go up. You are in equilibrium. Okay? So the derivative is 0 in the non-coincident set, where the u doesn't touch the phi. OK, um, so then this is the problem Caffarelli was talking about in 2005. And the observation, the key observation is that if you have a harmonic blanket that has some values uh, on, the, on Rn, then you take the normal derivative, and that is the Laplacian one half of f of x. Okay, so this derivative here, dy, is the Laplacian one half of its values on the trace, and also that one. So then, with this, uh, with this identity, 
Then what happens? The, the, on the trace, the membrane F, well, here it is, has to stay above the obstacle. This derivative, as I say, has to be um, negative here and zero here, but now that derivative is just this Laplacian one-half object. So the problem can be written in these terms, where you have this fractional Laplacian, okay? So, so what is this fractional Laplacian? Okay, that's the next question. Now how is this is becoming a non-local problem? So the fractional Laplacian, uh, for the Laplacian, which is two derivatives, you do Fourier transform, is multiplication by, by psi squared, and then for the fractional Laplacian, you raise that psi squared to the s, to the power s. That's my definition of fractional Laplacian. So, you see, when s is zero, this is doing nothing, just uh, you hat. So it's just the identity operator. When s is one, it's two derivatives, right? So when s is zero, is identity. When s is one, is two derivatives. What happens for s in between zero and, and, and one? Well, the two s that I have here will be between zero and two. And this operation will be a sort of fractional differential operation in the sense that if you take a function with C alpha derivatives or held their continuous of order alpha, then the fractional Laplacian, you lose two S derivatives. Right? You have a function that has one derivative or two derivatives, you differentiate once, you only have one derivative. You differentiate again, you have zero derivatives. Well, here, if you are held there of order alpha, then when you apply the fractional Laplacian, you lose two S derivatives. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now with this definition, you can write down what, what is this. What is this formula for this uh, fractional Laplacian? Okay, and it has this shape. And here is where I say that this operator is non-local. Okay, what does it mean to be non-local? If I want to compute this thing at a point x, I need to know the value of the function u everywhere in the space. Okay, so what happens far away is information that I need to compute the value at x. So it's not local. The differential equations are local. If you want to compute the rate of change of a quantity at a point, the only thing you need to know is the values of the quantity around that point. It's a limiting process. But here, no, you need to know everything. So it's not local. And one thing that happens here, there's this singular kernel. And this singular kernel, what forces is that solutions to equations involving this operator have to be regular. This is the, the, the key word we have been hearing all this night. Uh, 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 that, that, uh, so I guess that's why Luis Caffarelli, who liked regularity, uh, um, got also interested in using these objects. Um, okay. And now we know, thanks to Luis Caffarelli, that uh, this fractional Laplacian is to this non-local equation, so fractional order, what the, what the la typical Laplacian is to classical liquid PDs. Okay, so this is the main object you need to study. Vasquez said before, you need to know the Laplacian. If you know the Laplacian and everything works there, then, then you can complicate your life. Here the same. If you know the fractional Laplacian, then you can complicate your life, okay? But if it doesn't work for the fractional Laplacian, it, it won't work for the more, more general uh, model. Okay, so uh, the heat equation was related to the Laplacian, right? And what about this fractional Laplacian? Well, what happens is you do the same random walk, but now you have a non-local random walk. This time, instead of moving just to the left or to the right with probability one half, say you can jump anywhere in space to, the, to your left or to your right with a probability of, you know, I don't know, one over k to the one plus two s. Okay, so as before, every time step, I have, to, I have, a, I have a probability where I can jump anywhere, right? So the equation has to be non-local instead of one half, one half. Okay, so if you, if you write the equation for what is the probability of being at x at time t, this is the thing, right? I come in from time t minus tau to present time, and I can go to any position, hk, with this probability. Uh, it's a probability that is decaying. You can go very far away, but with less and less probability. Mm -hmm. And then you rearrange and do a limiting process as I did before, and you end up indeed with the uh, fractional Laplacian, right? And now it's not the heat equation anymore, but it's the fractional heat equation, okay? So uh, the random walks show up again. 
Okay, so uh, as I said, these are, these are non-local equations, so what is a non-local model? Right? In general, a non-local model is, a, is an equation of this form where you, have a, the, you want to find your u at x, but then you have to know everything in the whole space, and there is an interaction kernel. This is how the points x and z interact, and then you have a right-hand side. Okay, so, so what happens far away now affects the local behavior and instantaneously, right? To compute the equation, I need to know everything at once, right? Okay, and then another feature of this model is that there are no derivatives. So it's not a partial differential equation now. Uh, it's uh, an integral differential equation. Still, you have a difference. And uh, these non-local equation models have been, well, thanks to Luis Caffarelli in the mathematical community, especially the partial differential equations community, the analysis community, people have been looking at them because of his influence. Uh, but there are so many interesting and important questions that, that you can try to model with these uh, non-local equations. So the pandemic, right? Pandemic is uh, essentially, uh, right, the, 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 the pandemic was created or appeared very quickly, right? So it's like, and immediately affected everyone, right? Everyone in the world, everywhere, everywhere I go, I always ask, how was the pandemic for you? Because I, I try to understand, uh, because in March, we were all you know, affected very quickly, right? So that's, that's a global, a global um, phenomena, the spread of information. This is very interesting, I have here my phone, and then someone else, someone else at the end of the at the other end of the world posts something on a social media, and it comes directly to me and affects my behavior. Finance, of course, you know the stock market. So the stock market um, gets affected by, of course, globalization and global decisions. Right? Uh, so there is a, I don't know, a natural phenomena. Something happens in the, in the stock market, there is a political decision, there is an election in some country, then the stock market changes abruptly, right? So what happens far away affects you instantaneously. And since there are no derivatives here of, of the U, the, these are using image processes because they're in image processes the functions are discontinuous. You, know, you have a pixel here, a pixel there, a pixel there, these are discontinuous functions, so you don't have derivatives. Uh, and then, as I say, it it's related to this notion of having fractional derivatives that uh, I'm not going to talk much about that, uh, but uh, let me say that, uh, I I'll, I'll go back to this in a second, let, let me just say that. Okay, so Caffarelli has made uh, breakthrough contributions to the regularity theory of fully nonlinear non-local equations. Okay, not just partial differential equations, but in the last 15 to 20 years, to non-local equations. And uh, I'm going to mention three foundational papers that he wrote with Luis Silvestre, his, his former student. We have this first one in uh, Communications on Pure and Applied Mathematics, 2007. He studied this uh, translation invariant operators, where you take an infimum and supremum of a family of linear equations. This is fully nonlinear. And they study viscosity solutions. They study the uh, Alexandro Bakimalpucci estimate, this is a little bit more for specialists, uh, proof Harnack inequality, Heller regularity, C1 epsilon regularity. And there is a book on fully nonlinear elliptic PDEs that uh, was written by Caffarelli and Cabré uh, that is very famous among specialists. And you know, if, if you, you read the book by Evans then, and you want to go up, then that's, you have to jump to Caffarelli Cabré. No? And that's a book that has nine chapters. It's a 100 pages book, I mean, it's very nice, very well written and, and uh, very difficult, has nine chapters. So these results correspond to chapters one through five of the book, right? So this book is for elliptic PDs. This paper is for nonlinear, non-local equations. So what they did, what Caffarelli did for elliptic PDs, then he reproduced the whole thing for uh, non-local equations, chapters one through five. Okay, of that book. Now, the next paper, here in, uh, in these are very important journals, by the way, he studies these uh, equations with x dependence. And he said, well, if the equation is close to the fractional Laplacian equations, then the regularity of the fractional Laplacian transfers. So he has more regularity estimates. And that corresponds to chapter eight. So he already covers six chapters of his book, chapter eight. And the next paper, the Evans-Krilov theorem, 
he proves that if you have a concave equation, concave meaning that uh, it's the infimum of linear equations, uh, then solutions are classical solutions. You know, Stephanie mentioned the notion of weak solutions, and uh, here the notion of weak solutions is called viscosity solutions, and then, well, you can prove very easily that solutions exist, but then are they regular? Can you really, really compute this integral? And yes, you can, thanks to Caffarelli C2S plus epsilon regularity. And this corresponds to what chapter? Chapter six in the book. So out of the nine chapters, he covers seven. Uh, what about the other two? Well, the last chapter of the book applies the previous theory and the method of continuity to prove existence of solutions. So with all the theory he has, that chapter nine can be reproduced by a student. And the other chapter that was left out is chapter seven, which is Sobolev estimates and I don't know why they didn't do it. I guess at that point they say, okay, let, let the rest of the mortals think about that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, and, uh, and what about Abel? Abel was also non-local. So Abel was at the beginning of Kafari's career, also at the end of Kafari's career. And Abel, um, let me just mention that he solved the tau tokron problem, where you want to find a curve that no matter where you start, the time that you go down is always the same, okay? And then he said, well, uh, uh, let's solve the problem, and this is his solution, and in modern terms, this is a differential equation of fractional order, uh, where you have a fractional derivative, and uh, this is the first example of a problem of fractional differential equation, this problem by Abel, this solution by Abel. So Caffarelli also did work on fractional time derivatives. So Abel is at the beginning of Caffarelli in his dissertation, and at the end, together with his collaborators here, Mark Allen and Alexis Vaseo. So let me finish with uh, uh, some thoughts about the Caffarelli school. So first of all, well, Caffarelli is one of the greatest mathematicians of all times. I don't think anybody doubts that. And with his highly original ideas and geometric intuition, he has been able to break through problems that nobody else knew how to attack. And uh, we heard about the Navier-Stokes equation, the obstacle problem, the free boundary problems. But more than that, uh, he created the school. And uh, let me call it the Caffarellian school uh, that has its unique uh, language. For example, regularity, uh, you heard this word a lot, and rescaling, and some, some of the most common keywords in this school. A function is not a function, you know, a formula. It's, it's a geometric object, it's a membrane, it's a surface, it's a, a blanket. Regularity is expressed not in epsilon delta, as we teach in calculus to students, but it's expressed by means of, say, touching paraboloids. Now, you have a touching paraboloid, then that means something, right? Geometrically, that gives you the regularity. And this geometric intuition, you say, okay, yeah, let's put a parabola here, let's put a tangent plane over there. That's not enough. At the end of the day, you have to write down the theorem. You have to prove rigorously the theorem. So there are conditions for being in this Caffarellian school. You need to develop that geometric intuition, but you also need to be mathematically precise and rigorous. And also in his school, there is collaboration, there is generosity in sharing ideas, or there is generosity on your time. Uh, there is camaraderie and there is mutual respect. These are values that he had and, um, and he shows that and he transmits to everyone around him. Okay. Congratulations, dear Luis, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo, for your nice and energetic lecture. <laughs> uh, in view of time, maybe one quick question. Frank. So did I understand correctly that uh, in uh, around 2005 he started with these non-local functions, he had never looked at them before. So this was a completely new development in what he was doing? Well, he knew he knew what was going on because he had already the background in harmonic analysis. You know, that thing that when you take the derivative with respect to what you get the fractional Laplace, and that's something he, he already knew. And he had worked on this obstacle problem, not putting it into this non-local equation context, but purely in the PDE context. There was a paper in the 80s about the regularity of the Signorini problem. There is a paper with Atanasopoulos. Um, but, uh, uh, but then, 
you know, together with student Luis Silvestre, that's where he started really to, to look into this uh, non-local in 2000. 2005 is the dissertation of Luis Silvestre. So they started a couple of years before that. Yeah. Yeah. Since I'm bowling up, maybe I could tell other point. For exponents equal one half, the Signorini problem was already known. So in some sense, the Signorini problem was something that was in the spirit. But any of the rest of the exponents, hmm. a to s between zero and two, were completely unknown. And this is where Luis Caffarelli and Luis Silvestre wrote this beautiful works. Yeah. Are you, do, do you agree? Say again. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, also Sandro Salsa. Yeah. yeah. Okay, in view of time, thank you very much. Thank Pandora. you very much. An another <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the past one and a half hour and a little bit, uh, we've been celebrating uh, the Abel Prize 2023 by Luis Caffarelli, but also the beauty of mathematics and the beauty of nonlinear PD in particular. And you've seen that there's a lot to be said about this topic, so much that we're actually quite a bit over time. And uh, so now I look at the master ceremony we were intending, and that's why the chairs are here, to have a bit of a panel discussion uh, but there's also going to be a little reception afterwards with drinks. And um, so, what, what, Ella, what shall we do? <laughs> oh, let's have a discussion for uh, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so we, we keep it a bit shorter then. So, so if I may ask the three speakers to, to take a seat uh, uh, at the panel. And then let's see if the audience uh, wants, wants to enter into some discussions. Maybe I sit here to have the overview, okay. yes. Yeah. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, so, so, so here's the, the collective uh, memory <laughs> uh, and, and knowledge uh, about the nonlinear PDE t at your disposal, so please fire your questions. Yeah, uh, Frank. So how did this idea arise wh when you start to introduce these obstacles? Your first reaction would be, that's going to make life even much harder. <laughs> so uh, wh where did the insight come that that would actually pave the way to, to new things? Uh, the Apar ap apart from the fact that the problem itself is interesting, but, but it was also a trigger for other things that you would normally say, well, if you have these objects, you're gonna make your life much, much harder. Why, why would you even dream of, of taking that step? Okay, people working in um, material uh, physics were thinking about uh, phase transitions, where you have two uh, states of matter that do not mix. In some cases, there are two states of matter and they mix like uh, uh, vapor, water vapor in, in, in the air, right? But uh, in some cases, they do not mix and you see the separation. And uh, if the two phases are completely different and they have physics inside, separating them by a line is not clear. For instance, in the Gulf Stream, there is a line in the water in the Atlantic where a certain kind of uh, seawater separates from the other kind. But it's not very easy to trace it around. And if you go to the microscopics, there is no line. So the point is, could we get a simple example where this separation of the two phases could be studied and try to see if the mathematics of minimization a certain energy that separates the two phases and tries to identify the two phases and then see where's the line dividing and see that the two phases are uh, satisfied the mathematics. And, they, and then the, in this phase transition world, the obstacle problem is one of the easiest problems. So in terms of Luis Caffarelli, he at the beginning of his career as an undergrad student in Buenos Aires, he was interested in physics and engineering. Uh, but then he got more interested in mathematics. So he already had a background in that. In fact, uh, for the thin obstacle problem, he uh, typically mentions a book by Duvaux and Lyon on uh, mechanics, where in that book, there are all weak solutions, how to solve all these problems with a weak notion of solution, as Stephanie mentioned, 
And then there were all the questions of, well, are these solutions real solutions? Are there classical solutions? And that's where Luis uh, looked at those problems, yeah. Maybe I can add another aspect that is interesting. I mean, Luis Caffrelli belongs to some school, so they have this intuition and these origins. And then there is uh, the functional analysis school that you mentioned, the book by uh, Leon Sandivo. And then from that, there is uh, persons who influenced us very much, like uh, uh, Brezis. And Brezis was a very good friend of, uh, of Bert Pelletier in Holland. So uh, he, there was an organization where I participated of uh, free boundary problems in mechanics and mathematics in Europe. And there was a connection between the British school and the Caffarelli school. And the, in Holland, the main problem was the underground infiltration, where there is a free boundary between salt water and uh, sweet water. So the free boundary problems in water separation in underground uh, movements are very well known in Holland, and Hans is here. Can you get follow? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, totally, uh, <laughs> I uh, totally agree, uh, Juan Luis. That was, I think, back in the 80s that we had this, these European projects on free boundaries. And uh, from our side, from the Dutch side, uh, the contribution was really also the, the equations and the modeling of uh, fresh and salt water and of uh, uh, saturated and unsaturated, a uh, very nice class of free boundary problems where you have on one side elliptic equation, on the other side a parabolic equation, and how you describe the evolution. So yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, interesting times. And of course the, the theory of, of Caffarelli. By the way, I, mentioned, I met Caffarelli when I did a postdoc in Minneapolis in 79. So that's 45 years ago. <coughs> and he gave a class at that, during that year on uh, elliptic free boundary problems and the obstacle problem. Okay. And it took me, and it was a two hour class a week, uh, but it took me really more than two days to work out the notes because it was quite a, uh, a mess on the blackboard and uh, you have to remember <laughs> it at home, what, what, what was it about and so forth, but I enjoyed it greatly, yeah, thank you. Sorry that we didn't do much uh, focus on this connection with uh, water infiltration in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there are so many things to say. It was like an encyclopedia of pre boundary problems. Are there any further questions from the audience? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you uh, for uh, the nice talks. Um, so there were two mentions of concepts of solutions throughout the um, the talks. Actually, three, but mainly I was my question is about viscosity solutions and weak solutions. So weak solutions, at least to my understanding, are a bit more general. Viscosity needs some kind of ellipticity uh, or so. Uh, do you have some comments about that, or can they be used in general uh, to solve more uh, general PDs as, say, hyperbolic or so? But this is difficult to explain in uh, uh, depth. Uh, in, in some minutes, but the idea, if you are an applied mathematician, is very easy. The approximate methods or numerical methods where you produce solutions give you data, a data set, and you can put together a certain function by joining points. Now, is this function smooth or not? Is the question satisfied or not? So in this intermediate moment where you minimize an energy by numerical methods and find the minimum, maybe you can find something easier that is a weak solution or the viscosity solution or the entropy solution, certain kinds of, let's say, 
uh, applied solutions, where the number of derivatives is not enough, but it's good for physics. So there is a level of generality where the minimization of the numerical methods gives you something that is a solution in the physical sense. Caffarelli tells you that take this solution in the physical sense, I prove you that this is a classical solution in under certain conditions. So there is a, a gap between numerical, I mean, most engineers work with solutions in L2 with derivatives in L2. But derivatives in L2 does not allow to separate a, a certain phase from another phase. It's just a set of very irregular points in principle, right? If you want to separate two sets in phase transitions, you need something like continuous, right? Okay. I can give you a little gist of what Gula, uh, was the idea behind viscosity solutions. Viscosity solutions say you have a function that you want to say curves up, right? But you cannot take derivatives, right? Say a convex function, second derivatives are non-negative. No? So, so you cannot take derivatives. So how do you say that something is curving upward? You say, well, let's take something that I can differentiate, a polynomial, a quadratic polynomial, a paraboloid. I'm going to touch from above that function, right? So if I can do that, right, and I cannot touch from above with a, with a parabola that opens like that, it's because the, the thing is curving upward, you know? If the thing is curving upward, then I can touch from above, but objects that are like of this shape. That's the idea behind. Like you don't look at the at the at the function itself, but you, you look at this property that you can always touch from above with a certain geometric object. And then if you say, oh, I can do that at every point, then the function should be pretty much nice. That's kind of like the idea behind uh, viscosity solutions. Uh, is trying to forget about doing calculations on the function itself, but on objects that touch it. You know, if these touching things have certain properties, then those properties should be transferred into the function that you don't know anything about in principle. Yeah, Thanks that's kind of like the brilliant about your Caffarelli of, of looking at these things geometrically, right? Like how they should behave with relation to other objects that touch from above or from below. I think there was one last question for tonight, and uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think after so in Stefanie's talk, it was quite clear that there's like a main open problem uh, in the field. So I was wondering, in the yeah, for the free boundary problems or for the fractional equations, is there also some I don't know big open problem which is still uh, open? Well, for the non-local, I mean, the thing started like 15, 20 years ago, so there's a myriad of problems. Uh, there are very technical problems that uh, mathematicians would like to know. This, uh, the ABP estimate, for example, is one of them. But uh, yeah, there is, a, there is a whole world because there are also applications, say, for uh, um, population dynamics, you know, where you are here, but you have a certain range where you can see. No, and then you see the other population and you try to separate from it or mix with it. So uh, there are free boundary problems there that people don't know exactly yeah. how to solve them and what's the regularity. So, so th there is a myriad of problems now. There's an explosion in the past, I say 15, 20 years, uh, motivated by, by the questions Kafari started looking at. So, uh, yeah. I think that though, the idea of the millennium problems, which is a very strong idea of pure mathematics, concentrating on a very difficult thing and try to solve it, is a very nice idea. But uh, life is complicated. There is another way of thinking, uh, this idea of applied mathematics, where what you can find is infinitely many models, some of them more relevant than some other ones. But if you look at the applied mathematics for physics, the number of models is enormous, and you have to study each of them in his particular way of doing. Today I was looking at something of what you do now. And it's a different thing. I didn't know about this thing before. It's curious that every time you discover a new model, and you have to study the model in a new way. And what we're doing with this applied mathematics uh, uh, topics is moving like an army. There are 
hundreds of people working and moving the thing, working with uh, physicists, with <laughs> companies, with uh, artificial intelligence, with biology. Somebody around has to understand the theory, otherwise it's impossible to talk. The good point about Luis Caffarelli is that in his naive way, you talk to them about the new problem and he knew more or less what you were talking about. He said, now they lose the parabolicity, they don't do the argument, it is re it's regular, they don't know it. Yeah. So well, that's the point, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Joining people that are working, the army is going in this immense war around of applied mathematics, somebody is controlling what ha what's happening, somebody knows. I mean, this is what we try to know. Uh, who is go what is going on? Regularity is a strong way. Weak solutions were a strong way. I mean, ca everybody knows that uh, Kolmogorov was great, Sobolev was great, Leray was great, I don't know, Dirichlet was great. These people who unify what you are doing, because remember that there is an army that goes in infinite directions. <laughs> and you have to take care of the army. It's important. Yeah, and also if you say you change just a small thing in the PDE, the question you ask, you drop the assumption of incompressibility, completely changes the problem. It completely yeah, changes the behavior of the solutions and one has to, yeah. Yeah, for instance, some people could tell you, listen, incompressible is completely ideal. But if you begin with compressible, you don't understand anything, it's too difficult. If there is a divinity, I mean, the number of problems we can solve, it is graduated by good God. You begin with saying compressible, and then maybe someday you do compressible. But <laughs> Caffarelli says, what is incompressibility is a train, right? A train is incompressible. You push from here, it, the whole thing moves. <laughs> or the other example of incompressibility is, do you try to fix a pipe by yourself at home? You know, if you have a pipe leaking, or a pipe br br burst open, you're going to just push the water in, right? Because the water is incompressible. You can, you, there is no way, you know? So, he simply, he has that, uh, that way of simplifying things, making, make them totally understandable. Now I understand incompressibility, <laughs> thanks to him. Yeah. But yeah, it's also always important to start with the simplest, simplest problem, understand that first, that will give hints later to... Yeah, but Caffarelli always said, listen, it is not so simple, no. and then it is relevant. <laughs> Point is relevant. How do you know it is relevant? It's relevant if it solves another problem. Next, your neighbor will solve the same problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to compress some beer and wine. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the speakers for their wonderful thank contributions. And I think Frank will yes. formally close this session. So thanks to uh, all the speakers for your wonderful contributions, um, also on behalf of the uh, Royal Academy. Jan, thank you for putting this evening together and leading it. And thank you all for coming and, uh, and contributing to this very lively uh, discussion and evening that we have. And you're invited for uh, drinks in the lounge.